Yeah. Okay. Great. So people are joining then. Um, so Antonio, while everyone's joining, do you mind sharing the pre-course questionnaire in the chat? Um, if that's okay. I've not put it on the PowerPoint, sadly. Yeah, it's fine. Cool, so we'll just hang around for a few minutes to let everyone join. And once Antonia's got it, uh, we can post the pre-course questionnaire. So those, I, I suspect a lot of you guys have already attended the webinar, but if you haven't, it'd be really helpful for you to fill in that questionnaire. Uh, so the idea is to sort of have an idea about what your understanding is before and after the course and after the interviews. And we're sort of going to send out this post-course and post-mock interview questionnaire uh, sort of in January just to sort of follow up and see how you all did and how you found the course overall. Uh, and it's really useful for us to sort of evaluate things we can improve uh, and showing the sort of effects of the course as well. Just got it. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Don't worry. Um, so I've just seen a question pop up. So mock interviews, we're running the signups uh basically from now, uh, like after the end of this webinar. Uh, and we're gonna be allocating interviewers uh as soon as we as soon as we have those signups and we reach capacity. And we're kind of expecting that to happen. Uh, immediately after this webinar really based on the interest um, so we'll be getting to allocating people in the next week um, so for those who have an interview close up I'd, we've got a space on the form for you to specify that and we'll be allocating you to people and they'll be able to arrange something in the next week and if you can't uh, you know if that interviewer is not available you just need to email us and then we'll allocate you to someone who is So in terms of how it's going to work, um, so we're going to put the mock interview sign-up form after this webinar. Uh, you're going to need to fill in a feedback form for the webinar to get access to the mock interviews. Um, and that's the priority access. And then normal release is going to be tomorrow. Um, but it may well be that we fill up uh, just after this webinar anyway. So I'd stick around and give us the feedback and we'll give you an opportunity to get a mock interview for free, which is pretty good. Um, so now that everyone's joining, if I'll give you a couple more minutes just to put in that questionnaire if you haven't already. And Kitty and Antonio, my, my screen's still sharing, isn't it? With Luke's webinar. Yes, it's still sharing, yeah. Cool. And just some general housekeeping and things before we start as well. As per usual, if you've attended before, you know that um, if you could submit your questions down in the Q&A function at the bottom um, of your Zoom, and then um, we'll be monitoring that throughout the webinar. So we'll either type in an answer if it's quite a simple question, or we'll save it for the end when we do the Q&A. Cool. Shall we get going then? OK, I'll start in a sec. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to session six of Access the AFP. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the personal section of the interview. Um, if you would like to contact me after the fact, uh, you can email me on this email address and I'll try and get back to you. So quick introduction um, about who I am. So 
I'm Luke Weston. I'm a current academic foundation trainee at Oxford University Hospitals. My interest is in orthopedics and maxillofacial surgery, um, but I also have an interest in medical ed education and surgical education as well. So let's just quickly go through the objective of today's sessions. So we're going to be talking about the personal questions that you'll get through the interview, and I'll highlight what I mean by that as we go through. Um, this will cover what are the attributes of an academic clinician and how you meet those, um, portfolio stuff and how that applies to your interview, um, how to actually tackle the different types of questions you'll face in the interview, and identifying your personal talking points, uh, which will make you a strong candidate, and little bits of interview technique as well. So what this is not, uh, I'm not going to go through all the possibilities of what you could be answered. Obviously, it's the personal section, so it will depend slightly on your background. Um, and I won't be providing model answers um, because really this is an individual flair and what stands you apart from other candidates. There. So what are the personal discussion questions? So they make up to a third of the interview, okay? And they're often kind of interlinked with other parts of the interview. It might not immediately be obvious that it's a personal question, um, but actually there's a lot of personal attributes that you can then apply to certain questions. Um, it can be on a wide range of topics and kind of talks about all the aspects of what it is to be an academic clinician. And to be honest, I'd advise you prepare for all eventualities. So have something for each major category that they could ask about um, and have something well rehearsed. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, it's quite personal. So you can put your own spin on it. Um, what is it that makes you the best candidate? Um, really, this is the section that sets you apart because all the other stuff, um, you know, there's a maximum score you can get, you know, in the kind of uh, clinical case, you're right or you're wrong, basically. So these are just some example questions. I'm not going to dwell on them too long, but you can see it ranges from um, why do you want to complete an academic program? Um, to what will make you a good academic and what are your strengths and weaknesses. And then the next section that we'll be talking about is research. So this obviously talks about your background in research, but also, you know, what is research all about and why do we do it? And then also clarifying a few research terminologies. And then teaching. So your background in teaching, what you've achieved um, and what makes a good and bad teacher and a similar thing which is applied to leadership and management, um, and also how that applies to the NHS in a bigger picture as well. So what's the point of having to prepare all of this stuff and then knowing about it, you, you just wanna do some research, right? Well, that's true, but also there's much more to being a clinical academic than just doing research, okay? So really they're looking for very well-rounded individuals and not just scientists. So the personal questions really let them get a feel of what you can do apart from pull apart a paper and manage an acute situation. It really adds the kind of color to your application. So, and also remember you're a doctor first and an academic second. So you have to demonstrate that you have these wide ranging skills as you do in the rest of clinical medicine. So you also need to know you know, what are the parts of academia that you fit into? You know, what can you offer research? So what I've been alluding to are these um, aspects of the medical experts. So I think a lot of people with the um, specialized foundation programs, the, the research academic programs, um, they get very caught up over here on the kind of scholar end of the scale. They'll gear their application and their, um, Kind of interview very much on this aspect but actually in the interview they're looking for all of these aspects so you know the kind of teaching and leadership and management all comes into over here the communicator the professional part kind of is within what you've achieved so far but also how you are as a clinician and health advocacy is things like you know 
audit and you know the other clinical governance things and also interactions with patients and over here collaboration is also very important and you can demonstrate that through leadership and teaching roles so you can see by highlight by highlighting all these aspects within your cv you show that you're a medical expert which is really what they're looking for um, you know someone promising that will go forward and excel in both clinical and academic careers so first in order to answer these questions you need to understand what's in your portfolio, what have you achieved um, in order to get it out in a concise way? So the portfolio basically is a showcase of everything you've done. You don't specifically need a portfolio to bring to your AFP um, interview, but I, I think it's very, very wise to have at least, you know, a digital version in your computer with all the files so you know what's there. And it's much easier to keep things updated as you go along through your career than trying to put it all together for your bigger applications down the line. And yeah, so it will be assessed at further applications. So um, don't stress if you don't have that much. Um, it's really, I'd say, not about quantity. These interviews go by in a flash. So if you just have a few very nice examples or, you know, something that might seem small, but you've learned a lot from, um, you can really kind of spin things um, in a positive way. Um, and yeah. So, oh yeah, if you go back to session two, we talked about the CV and it's it's really the same kind of stuff, um, but portfolio is just everything. Um, this is how I personally structure my portfolio, if you guys want to take notes, um, but this might develop over time as I do different things, but this should kind of outline most of the things. Um, and also I, th I think, at least as, as far as I know, it's the important things that you need to list, you know, in interviews later down the line. So um, let's talk about how we tackle these topics now. So the first thing before going into this interview that you really need to get clear are your motivations. So basically, they're looking for people that are passionate about the AFP or the SFP that it is this year um, and also, you know, really know why they want to do it. So you can't have any hesitation when you're talking about your rationale for doing it and also why you want to do it at that specific place. It needs to be something that is really thought through. Um, otherwise, you know, they'll, they'll see right through you because, um, yeah, uh, anyway, we won't, we won't dwell on that. But so they also want to see that you can contribute to research um, and you're not just looking basically for bolstering your CV with the position. Um, or trying to get central locations. That's what I was alluding to just now. Um, you know, they want to see people that have potential to contribute. Um, and they're not necessarily looking for people that are going to do groundbreaking research, um, right, you know, during AFP. Realistically, that's not something most people will achieve. But they're looking for people with potential, which they can teach skills to. And you also need to reflect how the academic clinical career fits with your personal goals. So if you haven't seen it already, I hope you have. This is the integrated academic training pathway. Um, it was set up following a big worry from academics um, in medicine that we weren't putting enough people through into clinical academia. And you know that has implications in patient outcomes and medical innovation. Uh, going into the future. So this pathway was set up to allow people to be clinical and academic, um, allow them to do both careers. So there's various steps along the way. Um, the main place we're focusing at um, for this interview is here down at the Academic Foundation Programme, but you need to have an awareness of all of the rest of the training pathway. You should understand that when you join the AFP, it's a good stepping stone onto the rest of the pathway. You can you don't have to have an AFP to do the further stuff, um, but it's, you know, a lot of people that do the AFP do go on to do these things. So that's what they're looking for a little bit. So we'll also talk about some of the realities of being a clinical academic. So first of all, it's quite tough. So, you know, not only do you have to be performing highly in your clinical career, you also need to be performing highly in your academic career. There are expectations, especially when you get more senior in the career, that you know you're making regular publications. A lot of people become, you know, senior lecturers, which you know they have a lot of requirements from each end of the spectrum. 
be very busy and challenging life. Um, and that's, you know, also reflected into the AFP. You can have a lot of pressures put on you. Um, so you should know about this going in. So, yeah, you'll, you'll find that actually these things, you know, they don't line up with each other. A lot of the time they interact. So, you know, your rotor might be saying, you know, we've got these shifts, you've got to come in, you've got to stay late, you've got to do these things. But then your academic stuff, you've got deadlines, you've got to get abstracts off, you're doing presentations, all these other factors to take in. So you need to know that these can and will interact. And you also need to be quite a proactive person. Um, it is very possible on an AFP to sit back and not do much and not achieve much. You know, you're an adult now and you're expected to do your own work. So in order to make the most of the opportunity, you need to be quite proactive um, and you'll, you'll get a lot from it if you engage. And they're looking for people that will engage. Um, but at the same time, it's a very interesting career. Um, clinical academics often end up being a lot of the movers and shakers in the clinical and academic world. A lot become professors, for example, and can really shape practice within their trust. Um, and locally, nationally, and internationally. So we're gonna just, again, remind you of the types of questions that can come up. And then, so this is kind of things you need to think about. So why do we research? Well, we do it really to improve care of our patients. That's the main overarching goal of a clinical academic, right? So you need to remember that and think about how things affect patients. Um, you need to really understand the human aspects of research. Um, so that goes from patients to the groups that you work with and how you interact with those people. Um, you should also understand the basic research terms. And this goes back to at the start when I was talking about something that doesn't appear a personal question. Um, a good example could be a research style question so that ask you about research. And then you could feed in your own experiences of how you've learned this information. So um, you also need to understand how research is conducted as another bit of that. And the reason I put this in the personal section is, is as I've just said, um, you should try and feed in your own learning. So next is teaching. So if you didn't know, doctor is actually derived from teacher in Latin. Um, and basically disseminating information is really important. Uh, probably more important than actually having the information. If you can't tell anyone about it, then it doesn't really mean much. So if you can teach well, I think you'll do well in a reasonably well in a research environment where you're presenting and trying to write publications. I think you need a reasonable understanding of how to teach people. Um, and also it shows that you can collaborate and work with other people well. And also, Things um, that are good about teaching is you tend to get feedback and stuff, and you can learn how to improve your own skills. So if you have teaching background, then talk about how you learned from those and how that made you a better teacher, a better presenter, etc. So again, these are some of the examples. Um, and then so then we're talking about leadership and management. So academic clinicians often are quite involved in influencing change within their organizations. Um, so leadership and management is quite key. Um, so you should discuss the experiences you've had and how you've learned from them and how you aim to grow as a leader within the future um, and how the academic program feeds into that goal. So basically, being a leader and being able to manage is, is quite a complex skill. It's quite hard to kind of put your finger on exactly what it is, but essentially how it applies to the academic program is, you know, you're taking something from an idea, putting it through a study that takes quite a lot of management, getting a team together um, or working with a team and then implementing things that takes, again, lots of management, but slightly different at this point, um, bedside stuff, you're starting to work a lot more with trusts, implementing change, working with other healthcare professionals, and then um, improving patient care. So you're being a leader 
and uh, for your healthcare professionals um, and helping improve care. So that's really like the top end of um, academic clinical pathways, kind of very involved with the organization that you work with and helping bring things to the forefront. So again, these are some of the questions that can come up and you should think about how your examples um, and things you've experienced apply to these kinds of questions. So that's quite a lot to take in. Um, now we're going to talk about how you identify your talking points that you're going to bring up to answer all these questions that we've just gone through. So um, every answer should have kind of a personal spin because obviously it should be quite individual to you. Um, and try to think of something that is reasonably unique. Um, everyone's got unique things that they've done. Um, but, you know, if, if it's sli something slightly different than the usual, uh, they might remember you a bit more because they're interviewing a lot of people. And think how it fits into the questions we've gone through. Um, basically, they want to show, they want you to show quite a broad understanding of what it involves, what it takes to be kind of a clinical academic covering all the fields that we've talked about so you shouldn't just focus on research for example and you should probably make yourself sick <laughs> so once you've found your examples from your portfolio basically just you know either write down a script and then just keep repeating it to yourself um, and try and spinning it out of different questions so say for example um you've you've got a good teaching experience, um, you helped run a teaching course um, that can factor into kind of teaching questions, what makes a good teacher, and then you can talk about other teachers that you worked with. Um, you could also put that into leadership or management, depending on your involvement within that course. You can see how one example applies to different fields, but you're just exploring different avenues within it. So in terms of finding them, I'd say you want to choose two to three of the best things you've done, ideally different from each of these different areas that we've mentioned from your portfolio and kind of flesh them out. And as I've said, just uh, keep rehearsing them and practice, practice, practice. Um, and try and, yeah, like I said, put it into different examples, but try not to force it, obviously. So. The reason I say two to three is really we're looking for quality over quantity. And when you're answering a question, try to just stick to one example and really flesh it out. Um, you don't want to kind of, you know, scatter bomb them with lots of different examples of things you've done because that won't have any depth and they won't necessarily understand the significance of the things you've done. So it's better to do answer questions with like one, max two different examples, but make sure they're really kind of relevant and talking through. And don't worry if you've talked about it in the white space. Um, chances are they probably haven't read your white space questions. I'm sure it's a different process that goes through those. Um, so yeah, just talk about those same examples um, and bring it back to the bigger picture. Remember, you're trying to sell yourself as a clinical academic. Um, so, okay, maybe they're asking about one specific thing within research or teaching but you should try and bring it back to the broader aims of what you're trying to achieve your goals why that is you want to be doing the afp like you kind of finished every question with bringing it home to why you should be a candidate here and then finally um how do these examples demonstrate you'd be a good clinical academic um yeah so that's kind of what i was saying just before so just yeah, make sure you bring every question back to that at the end. So a couple of interview tips, just generally speaking. So you don't have very long, so you really want to be talking quite efficiently, um, but not rushing. It's a fine balance. Um, but you want to get as many good quality words out as possible and don't fumble with your words either. You want to be confident, uh, talk with assertion about what you're talking about, look knowledgeable about what you're talking about. Be open and relaxed with your body language. Try not to bring your shoulders in and hunch, okay? You wanna sit back, open body language um, and be engaged. 
eye contact's massively important. You should try to, if it's one person in the room, it's quite unlikely, it's about 70% looking at them, 30% away. Um, but if it's more, you want to split your eye contact between them individually. You can, if you're going to look away, look up to the side, to the corner, never look down. Just goes back to the confidence and body language and dress well. You know, it's an important interview. Please just go get a nice suit. If you've got one at home, wear it. If not, you can rent one. Just, you should look the part. It's, it's a big interview and they will take note if you're dressed well. And also this is kind of a bit of a sneaky one. So you wanna maximize your talking time. So what I mean by this is they'll ask you a question and you should just expand on that. You should keep expanding until they stop you, move you on to the next question. If you just answer their question with one sentence and then stop or pause, they'll just move on to the next question and you will have lost lots of potential points at that question. So this is what I was talking about throughout. So you wanna answer the question specifically, flesh out what you mean, and then draw it back to why that makes you a good candidate, why that makes you a good clinical academic why you should have the place and how that draws into your plans within the future. So this is what I mean by lead the discussion. They've asked you one specific question, but you've given them this whole big answer and in-depth overview of why you're a good candidate. And also show your humanity, try not to be a robot, um, try not to be too cocky or arrogant, etc. Try and be quite relatable. Um, you'll probably be their colleagues. A lot of them are interviewing for their departments, etc. So uh, try and get on with them. So quick summary. So basically, you want to understand the career before going into this interview. You want to question all your motivations, make sure you've got it nailed down so you can answer in a heartbeat. You need to review all of your achievements to date and have a think about what the most relevant examples are and then kind of get them in a comprehensive way that you can talk about them. And then work on your technique. So basically practice, talk to yourself in the mirror, practice to friends, practice with your mum. Recording yourself as well. You can see all the little ticks and bugs that you have. Try and get rid of those. Okay, so that's the end. Thanks very much, guys. Um, I think these are probably expired now. <laughs> there might be new ones that Connor will give to you in a moment. Okay, thanks very much. So uh, yeah, that was Luke Weston, a friend of mine. And so he did this session last year. Sadly, he couldn't attend um, live this time. Um, but I hope you guys found that recording useful. He's pretty insightful on interview tips and has been very successful at numerous interviews. So um, now we're going to just go through and answer your questions. I think Basically, the thing to do now would be if you have any questions, just let us know and put, pop them in the chat um, and we're happy to answer them live. Um, if anyone has anything else, I'll just put this up. So there's one question here. Um, do you have any advice on what to do if one of the interview panelists is someone who has agreed to be your supervisor? Do you advise to talk about why you chose to work with them, work you are planning for the SFP, SPF, sorry, SFP? Um, I, I think that's kind of, it's kind of a hard question. Um, yeah. I, I think it would be difficult to not be thrown by being interviewed by the person you're planning to work with. I think uh, that's naturally going to be quite intimidating, particularly if you don't know them already. Um, I think the best thing is to just try and rely on your practice for the interview um, and note that obviously they might even be assessing you on your clinical and your academic stuff. So really you've got to present yourself in the best way possible um, and justify your reasons for working with them. Um, and if you've already agreed, if they've already agreed to be your supervisor, you could probably talk with them about your reasons and get some feedback beforehand um but i think usually in these sorts of situations if 
that could be seen as like a conflict of interest and they may not actually take part in your interview process and declare that beforehand anyway um so yeah would you guys have any advance on what i've said uh yeah i just add on to that so for me so what you said last there connor definitely there was somebody who knew me sort of what i've done over medical school and knew that i wanted to work with them and they have kind of elected not to interview me um, I don't know how it would work for each particular deanery, but that does happen. So, I mean, it depends on, you know, how much you already know them and like, is it sort of a thing where you've emailed them once prior to, to applying for the AFP and you know that that's the area of interest you want to go to, or is it someone that you've already worked with loads who knows that you're going to apply and who maybe has already helped you um, a little bit with white space. And, but that decision is not up to you, it will be up to them. Um, and then I guess the other thing is like if they end up interviewing you and if the topic of something that you discussed between yourselves comes up, I would probably just discuss it um, as with you would with any of the other panel interviewers, but probably avoid name dropping anything. So I wouldn't say like, you know, I'm going to be doing this with interviewer X who is sitting right there. I probably just describe some ideas of what you discussed and, and go with that. There's another question. Um, do you advise on mentioning non-work related reasons as to why you want to apply to that deanery or area? Do you guys have any thoughts on that? I, I, I think it's a tactful one to balance. I, I, I think I've heard verbatim academics that I won't name say that, you know, coming to a specific deanery is not the reason why they're looking for a candidate um so so i think I, I, particularly if it's like in a nice city or something like that i i think i'd avoid using those sort of elements in your in your discussion i think i'd probably focus on you know what you can bring to the institution why that institution is particularly good for you uh, in terms of research education or leadership opportunities um, and you could throw in as, oh, you know, like it'd be great to be here as well because I like it here and whatever. But I really wouldn't lead with that. Yeah, I agree. And um, there was a question about um, would the interviewers have seen what you put onto Oreo or your white space questions? So again, I think we sort of very lightly, Luke has touched on this during his webinar. So this is slightly different for all the deaneries and impossible to know whether they do or do not. Um, some of the interviews I've attended um, on the day, they had a copy of all the answers that I put onto Oreo in front of them. And I don't think they read it through beforehand, but they do sort of flip through it as you go along just to, I guess, check what you're saying matches what you've put onto your application. In some other places, I get the feeling that they have never seen what I put onto Oreo, rather like whether it's the list of publications or, you know, the white space questions. So I would go into the interview with the expectation that they don't know about it and like don't be self-conscious about repeating things that you wrote verbatim on your white space questions is what I would I think say. That's, I think that's really important that you don't not mention things that you put in your white space questions just because you think that they read it. So unless they ask you specific questions about the stuff that you've written in the white space questions, otherwise just assume that they haven't read your, your white space questions, I would say, because a lot of people end up, or like a lot of my friends ended up not mentioning the things that they put in their white space questions and then lost quite a few points, I suppose, in the interview. And on a related note, someone's asked, where they ask questions or drill you on things you've written in your white space? Um, so again, as far as I know, I don't know obviously about all the different deaneries, but going by what we've just said that you should assume they haven't read it. And um, most of the time they just have a set number of questions that they ask every candidate. So it's very unlikely that they've gone through your application and developed personal questions related to you. I think, when in doubt, just treat as if they haven't read, haven't read it, and then you know mention all your most important achievements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then they might ask a follow up question in that sense. But I don't think. Well, I think it would be unlikely, personally. 
Um, so somebody else has asked, how long should your response to a question be? Um, I, I think that's an incredibly difficult question to answer because it, it really depends on that the context of that question and the interview. I think you've got to go on instinct about what is the most appropriate thing to say in that moment. Um, and like Luke was saying in the webinar, um, if you focus on having a few really quality responses to a set a predetermined set of questions that you can think of for any generic, you know, academic, educational, personal interview, then you should be able to answer that on the fly. And I think the thing we'd emphasize is practice. Um, so practice loads with your friends or with your housemates if they're also applying. I was fortunate to live with Luke uh, and you sort of, we helped each other quite substantially practicing, you know every day before our interviews and and i think that that will help you develop sort of a natural approach to these questions uh, that will help you through the interview process and, and i said i wouldn't really ascribe a time limit because uh, it's really hard hard to do that i went when i was preparing for interview i went for a kind of a one to two minute time limit on every question just because um you will end up speaking longer than you think you are, or at least that was what my personal experience was. Um, and in the end, you do end up just getting kind of interrupted by the yours anyway, if you end up rambling. Yeah. So um, just while we're answering questions, I've just seen, uh, so this is the feedback form. Um, so if you've either followed the QR code or that link in the chat, um, which I think should bring you to the same, let's just double share that brings me to the same yeah, one. I've just posted all the links in the, in the yeah. Um, chat as well. Yeah, so that would bring to the same one. And then provided you fill in that form, um, you'll get a link to the mock interview. Um, and just... Um, an overall thing, uh, we're not allowed to give any information on any specific deanery interview structures or questions that they asked. Um, so sorry yeah. if you're asking those questions, I'm just going to have to dismiss it. Yeah. Um, some, are, some people mentioned ethics mentioned in stations. Can you give an example of that? Um, so, so ethics, comes in like a few forms it could be something like a difficult situation with a patient to handle or it could be with like difficult colleagues um for example some common ones um for example you need to give a blood transfusion to someone with an upper gi bleed but they're jehovah's witness how would you handle that or a patient who's threatening to self-discharge how would you handle that or you know you really need your registrar and come and see somebody and they've refused or haven't come after a couple of hours what would you do if you're really concerned um, so I think those are some examples of kind of difficult situations that that might be worked into the clinical scenario. So the whole station might not be about ethics, like an ethical scenario, but they might work some of that into a clinical scenario component. Um, if you don't know the answer to a question, how can you say you don't know, but still sound slick? <laughs> Don't lie anything. and try and bullshit your way through it. I think that's probably that's probably. Yeah. I, I I had a I had a so I I had a question where I was asked about a primary outcome measure, um, and I sort of said I think there's two primary outcome measures, and the response to me was, "Can there be two primary outcome measures?" Which I I think is. Up, up for debate but I, I, my simple response because I was like I'm not going to argue with him was I, I thought there was uh, and <laughs> I thought it could be and then I just moved on so you know I, I think if if you're looking like you can't answer a question I think just admit defeat and move on swiftly and then take charge of the conversation um, and keep on going um, I think yeah I mean, I think realistically, you know, as an F1, there will be lots of things that you don't know. So if it was a clinical situation that you don't know the answer to, um, be honest, like Connor said. And then, you know, realistically, what would you do in real life if you didn't know? You'd probably call a senior to ask what to do. Um, or, you know, the other popular answers is, you know, check the trust guidelines to make sure there isn't something already there that can help you. 
um, and kind of along that vein, but, you know, just saying like, you know, where to get help and things like that is useful. In my Bristol interview, I also said that I wasn't like, I wasn't sure um, how to answer that question. And then they basically just gave me the question in a different form and I guess suppose like simplified it a little bit and then I was able to answer it. So maybe it's always better to say that you don't know than to bullshit and they might give you a different chance to answer the question. Uh, realistically, real, I've got yeah, a question sorry. here. Sorry, realistically, do most strong candidates have supervisors projects sorted already? I didn't have a project or a supervisor sorted. I don't know about you guys. No, I didn't because uh, I didn't know what theme no. I was going to get. So no. Uh, not not for Bristol. I I did the Leeds interview as well, and I because uh, I went to Union Leeds as well. Uh, set myself up with a. Prof a professor that really I really wanted to work with and, and so on and I did speak about that in the interview but yeah I, I don't know how well that was received um, I think it's difficult it's difficult to know I, th I think it's important to to if you have an idea about where you want to go and who you want to work with I think you should be honest about that um, because saying if you say that oh yeah I want to go to Leeds because they offer a PG cert or or this specific lab-based research project, but you don't really want to do that, um, then I think that will come across. Whereas if you talk enthusiastically about, uh, you know, a professor that you want to work with and projects that you specifically want to do, then I think your enthusiasm will come through and that will present you better in that interview. Um, on a related topic, how do you get allocated the research theme? So again, this is very different depending on the deanery that you apply to. Some deaneries are complete free for all. So as long as you get accepted as an AFP, then you can find your own supervisor and do whatever project to your heart's content. Most deaneries will have um, different tracks with specified um, research themes, like, I don't know, respiratory or pediatrics or something like that. And they all have a different process of ranking it. Um, so it depends on where you go. So um, for example, in Bristol, the year that we applied, there were two surgical posts, one renal post, one respiratory post, et cetera, et cetera, a couple of anesthetic posts and a couple of primary care. And it really depends on where you apply. Most of the time, this information should be available on their postgraduate website. So um, in most deaneries that I've researched when I was applying, they usually have some something like a document su um, suggesting all the posts clinically that you're expected to do, and also like any overarching themes or how do you go about finding a supervisor and that sort of thing. So that should be available information. Um, um, if you're offered a job in each deanery, will you receive these at the same time within 72 hours of each other, or are you not able to wait to hear from them both? So for that, you will um, get the offers at the same time. But if you, for example, get um, an offer for the in the first round for one of the deaneries, you will only be able to see that offer um, and don't know whether or not you might get another offer for from the other deanery in the second round. So once other people have not taken up their offer for that deanery, um, so you could technically take a gamble and not accept an offer in the first round to get an offer in the second round, but um, yeah, just it would just be high risk basically. But you do get the offers um, together. Yeah. Um, so the next question is: How many hours of practice slash days on average did we spend overall prior to the interview? Um, I think that's going to be really variable depending on the person. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I, I think for me personally, it was at least at least a month, if not more, um, before the interview that I was sort of practicing with Luke and get sort of getting ready. I think once we put the applications in, we were sort of practicing and, and doing stuff, but uh, we were we weren't doing it every day for that entire time. It was really only in the last week or so um, because it, it, it at least for me at that time it was impractical to be doing that because I had really long days on GP um, so yeah it it re it's really variable for everyone I, I don't know what what you and Antonia think Kitty um, I think 
I think I was about the same, Connor. I think uh, I started practicing almost as soon as I kind of submitted the white space questions and the whole application. Um, so that was, I think it would be about a month. Just starting like, maybe not intensely practicing for the entire month, but just like the fact of like yeah. starting to look into what sort of things could be asked and then making sure I know all the like, um, statistical terms and what I'm talking about and that sort of thing. I think for me, it was as soon as I kind of got, I knew that I was going to go for interview. Um, but I would say that writing your white space questions and kind of just looking at what you're interested in, which you probably have done, you know, for like the last final two years of medical school is already kind of practicing for interview. Um, so I wouldn't feel disheartened just because you've not started several months before your interview. Um, in relation to that, how much time in advance of the interview did you get your invite? Uh, that, from what I remember, that varied significantly by deanery as well. Some places sent out their invites, I think, like a week or two before, while some other places sent them out, you know, reasonably, I don't know, a couple of weeks, a month beforehand. So to be honest, I would, I wouldn't like say, oh, I'll just wait to see if I get invited to an interview. Um, especially if that particular deanery has a has a reputation for sending it out late, I'd probably just start thinking about it now. Plus, yeah. even if you don't get an interview, you'll have practiced how to do it and you'll use exactly the same skills later on. Agree. Um, should you talk about the themes you're interested in specifically at your interview? I, I did. I did. Um, I don't know whether you did, Antonia. I didn't because I, I still don't know what I'm interested in but there you I think that there's no real like right answer for that. I think one thing to be aware of so I made it very clear that I was interested in surgery and you know they might challenge that they might ask about you know what if you don't get onto this specific track you know what will you do then or you know they might ask about have you considered other things like this or that basically what they're trying to say is if you don't get this specific one you're applying for in a deanery where that you know you get allocated one or the other um will you reject the post i think is what they're trying to suss out um so i would think about your answer for that type of question as well um what are the average competition ratios for a post at interview um I think that information is online somewhere, maybe. Yeah, I think so. So the UK Foundation Programme publishes the competition ratios every year. Um, I think they publish how many people get the post compared to how many people submit an application. I can't remember yeah. if they have a specific so, section so, on interviews versus like actual. So so with that, I, I, there's none of that information is public in terms of who gets uh, shortlisted and then goes to interview and then gets a place however it, it's who applies and who gets it is available we, we've actually listed that on our website so if you go to the uh, but that's less useful if you've already got an interview so it's it's just sort of application to uh, success ratio that we have and that's on the deanery selection section um, but I, I think with all of these things, I think it's best not to think too much about competition ratios. Mm. Um, I think just go for the places that match your own interests um, and try and find a way to sort of show them that you can, you can also be of interest and provide to that institution. Um, and if you can do that, I think, you know, you don't need to worry about competition ratios. And and the interview can be a big differentiator between somebody who has loads of points on their CV and somebody who maybe doesn't, um, but comes across really enthusiastically. And, and the key message, I think, is that they're not looking for complete and, you know, PhD level researchers um, for most of these posts. The, the Academic Foundation Programme was actually developed to provide research opportunities to people who hadn't done much research before. Um, so I think don't be intimidated by these competition ratios because that's it. it's not as bad as it seems. What's the best practice to do in the last few days before an interview? That's very interesting. What do you guys think? 
I think I just spoke to myself. <laughs> but it sounds better the way that Connor and Luke did it, I think, just like asking each other. I think um, but I yeah, did I didn't really have anyone thing. to practice with. I think I did a similar thing. So when I was preparing for the interview, I made so I would speak out loud and then I would make notes on what I think like what I spoke that was valuable to say in the interview and I jotted that down um as I went along and then I think for the last few days I just looked over what I wrote down and made sure that that was in my head like you know the kind of barn door expected questions for example like why do you want to come to this deanery and making sure I just have all those bullet points of specific things to that location that I want to talk about that I want to mention um just have that in my head um, like as as well as practicing with Luke, um, I was a bit cheeky and I got in touch with um, various foundation trainees and I and I actually asked them to do a mock interview for me. Yeah, um, and uh, I was lucky to get about three people uh, that in the last sort of few days before, like actually right before my interview. Um, so I, I think you might. Uh, be surprised by how many people would actually offer you an interview just if you get in touch with them um, and say oh can you ask me a specific question about this and just give me some feedback on a on a five minute response um, as well as that just doing what Antonio and Kitty did which is sort of practicing on your own uh, as you're shaking the day before the interview uh, <laughs> um, you know and just making sure that you've got everything together in terms of the academic terms um, like I used Anki flashcards, which I've actually put on the website, um, the, the ones that I used uh, for learning all of the academic terms as well as the clinical stuff. Um, and I'd encourage you guys to do the same. It's a really efficient way of, of learning all of that stuff, particularly if you're cramming it. Um, so, yeah, there's also, lots of different things you can do. Yeah, and also like in the last few days or like the day of interview and stuff, you really don't have... Um, capacity to think of any new things to say so like having those things written down in front of you like you know like any exam really I think is sort of reassuring I remember turning up to my interview location like an hour early because I was paranoid I was going to be late and I just sat in my car and read over my answers like an idiot yeah <laughs> but it, it's nice to know that it's there like because then I can be like yeah. okay well you know, in an hour's time I'll talk about this um, do interviews only happen in one period, i.e. you can't be invited to interview after the window, for example, if people don't take up offers? I, we don't um, know that. <laughs> as far as I don't I really think they can. Do. I think I thought... So the, the so, year I applied, I remember like some people got emails saying like, hey, you haven't been shortlisted for the interview, but we've kept you on reserve. So I, oh. I, I don't know how that works, but I think I guess if people decide not to go to the interview for whatever reason, maybe you could be on the reserve list for that. But all interviews tend to happen over the same couple of days and they don't generally do another lot after. Um, I don't know if you have any other different experiences. So, yeah, I, I thought that um, you basically like everyone they want to interview, they're going to shortlist and then then they give up the off like they give up the offers and then people might not be interested in taking up the offer but they're still going to pick someone who's been interviewed previously. Um, yeah. Also just because it's very, very unlikely that someone wouldn't attend their interview, I think, um, because otherwise, why would you write the white space questions? Why would you go through the entire yeah. process? Yeah. yeah, I think it's very unlikely to be asked for an interview once you've been declined. Um, would I need to take with me a portfolio that is online so I have something to show, screen, share, etc. Uh, I don't know about when the interviews are online. Um, when they were in person, some deaneries ask you to bring your CV and some evidence, some deaneries don't. So I would just double check. Like usually they yeah. send you an email with some instructions and whatnot before the interview. So I just triple check what they wrote there. So a lot of places ask you for your evidence for the points and publications and stuff like that to check physically. Um, so I, I check what the requirements are for that for each place um because i know i know bristol required us to bring um all of our evidence physically um to show an administrator so i did a zoom interview um with bristol and manchester and they both didn't ask me to bring anything just screen share or anything but i was i did have to upload all the original copies to oreo mm. um so i suppose that's kind of what it was 
um, yeah, in general, I kind of agree with you guys that just see what the email says when they invite you. If you yeah. you have to not bring it. And I guess, I mean, like in general, it can't hurt to, to prepare that. I mean, like it will be useful for future anyway, just to keep track of your portfolio. So if you have a publication, maybe like print screen, print screen the PubMed page or the PubMed ID and stuff like that and just have that at the ready. Um, any books that you would recommend? I didn't use any books, so I don't know about that. I think that I screened out. Um, um, I'd recommend our website. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> I'll just plug that. Uh, we've got uh, loads of information there. So we've actually got a written guide, which I guess is a free book. Um, so yeah, I'd have a look at that. Um, there's other AFP books. I think there's one by uh, another sort of AFP course, High Yield AFP, um, by the guy Anka Kajuria. I forget what it's called, but that's quite a good book. Um, I think that's the only one that I know of that's a specific book, but then there's a few other websites and stuff as well. Um, the only one that I flipped through was this one, which is not AFP specific but everyone seems to buy this for any medical interview like post-grad. And it's quite useful, not so much for academic stuff, but like clinically and also like the difficult situations we talked about earlier with ethics. Um, this has got quite nice outlines to it. So, I mean, I guess if you buy it, then you can just sort of have the peace of mind knowing that it will be useful, even if not for the AFP interview, then in your future kind of postgraduate interviews. So, yeah. Um, so how oh the book is called I'm just going to show that again. is it backwards no 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 at all. oh great um so the next one is how do you find the contact of current afps so there's a few ways for me personally i did linkedin um research gate is another one um or just people from your own university so um, I was lucky to know a few people that got onto the academic programme uh, from Kiel. So uh, they gave me loads of help. Uh, and then I obviously contacted other people via other means. Um, I don't know how you guys got in touch with anyone else. I didn't get in touch with anyone, but someone's gotten in touch with me via research game. So yeah, yeah that's... Cool. Um, I've just posted the title of the thing on the chat if anyone wants to have a look. I'm sure you can find it on Amazon if you type like medical interviews. Yeah, so those who filled in the feedback form, you should have all got the email um, automatically that has the mock interview sign up. So, um, We'll be in touch in the next few days um, in terms of allocating those who can be interviewed. Um, I think our capacity is really quite limited. And unfortunately, that's going to mean that some of you guys uh, may encounter not getting a mock interview. Um, we're trying to expand this capacity, but obviously, you know, it, it may not be in time for your interview potentially. So uh, we're trying our best, but obviously, as you can appreciate, running free mock interviews uh, for over 100 people is quite an uh, organisational task. So, uh, yeah, it's unfortunately not everyone's going to get one. Um, and, and we'll try and, yeah, sorry, we'll try and get people with the people with AFPs from the deanery that you've applied to, but again because we've got limited numbers of um, academic F1s or F2s doing it so um, it might it might happen that you won't get it with someone who um, is from the deanery you've applied to but yeah we'll try. And just to say we've standardised the questions that uh, we'll be asking the mock interview so it, in a way it doesn't matter so much who you get because it will still be the same set of questions that we've already set up. Um, there's quite a few people saying they haven't got the link, etc. cetera. Um, um, so I've got a few emails back saying that people have entered their emails wrong. 
Um, so it's so basically, it's, you should have got an email uh, from Access the AFP, and I can see that it's been sent successfully to quite a lot of people. So if you've not received it, either check your junk mail um, or or fill in the form again, and it should send it to you. Okay. Any other questions? It doesn't have to be like specific to the person in the view, anything at all. When we were here regarding mock interviews, um, so like we said, we'll start sorting it out within the next few days, um, probably allocate, aim to allocate most of you guys within the next week. Um, and we'll try and give priority to those people who have their interviews early in November. Um, I think as as another as another point, um, if you are filling in the feedback form and you then get access to the mock interview sign up, um, please also use your university email. Um, like I know it's a bit of a faff, but it's just to make sure that we are getting university candidates that are signing up and 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 using it. Yeah, so the earliest interviews I believe this year do start on 10th and 11th, so we'll try our hardest to get some of you guys in before then, but obviously it just depends on when people are available. Um, so hopefully, yes. Cool. Um, so for those of you that haven't received it, I'll just have a look through and, and, and go through. If you just send me an email, if you've if you filled in the feedback form and you've still not received the link, then just let me know and I'll go and check that it's been filled in. We'll probably just stop recording, but we'll kind of stay in for a few more minutes. Yeah. 